my father, Zechron Levracha, had a yard site on the 13th day of Sivan. He had a yard site the day on which he lost 22 immediate family members. During the Holocaust, my father's father was beaten to death by the Nazis. And he was the only one that was Zeichel Lekvura, that was actually buried. A little while later, the rest of the family went on a transport to Auschwitz. And although my father and some of his siblings survived, his mother and 21 other members of the family, brothers, sisters, brother and sisters-in-law, and nephews and nieces, died on that one day. And although I grew up in my father's home, he could never speak about it. He could never say a word about it. When we went together to Yad Vashem when I was a teenager, he walked in, looked at a mural in the wall, turned pale, and said he couldn't continue, but he wanted me to continue. He didn't speak about it. And as I grew up, I saw in that the initial behavior of Eov. In the book of Eov, Eov suffers the death of his children, the loss of his fortune. And the Pusik says that when his friends came to be Menachem Avel, he could not speak, he was silent. And so, all my life, I've lived without the message. The message was silence. And then, yesterday, I attended the funeral, as most of you did. And yesterday, Rav Gabriel, the father of these seven children, got up to speak. It was the most magnificent lesson I've ever heard in my life. The most extraordinary speech, the greatest Musser. I've heard classes from Rav Moshe Feinstein and Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, from my Rebbe, Rabbi Avraham Palm. I've heard classes from Chacham Avadia, from El Yashiv. But in everything, anything I've ever heard, the strength of yesterday's speech was greater, more meaningful, more practical, to get up and say that when we suffer, we surrender our will to the will of Hashem and we move on with strength. I was standing there, I was standing outside and I heard my father's voice from heaven speaking to me and telling me I went through everything and I picked myself up and I prayed and I learned and I raised children in the way of the Torah because when we don't understand, we surrender our will to the will of Hashem. And then I opened the book of Eov. Rav Schwab's explanation of the book of Eov, on page 165 through 166, you will see Rabbi Gabriel's, Gabriel's speech. You'll see the speech said centuries ago in different words. And the way Rav Schwab writes, we're commanded to try to understand God. We're commanded to try to understand the ways of God. But sometimes we hit a stone wall. We don't understand. 
And then we say, it's time for the Akedah. Avraham Avinu was told to bring his son and sacrifice his son as the Akedah. It says Rav Schwab, Eov had his Akedah. It was the Akedah Sadas, the Akedah of the intellect, of the understanding, of saying, God, I don't understand, and I sacrifice it to you. That speech echoes down from the very beginning of the Jewish people. It echoes down through the years of my father's silence. And it comes to me as a lesson, a lesson in dealing with difficulty. Rav Schwab says we have to understand as much as we can about God's ways. So let me share a little bit of what Chazal teaches us. We have an expression that has to do with the Pesach holiday that in Egypt, on the night of Makas Bechairais, the night the Jews left Egypt, they were told, stay in your homes. It's dangerous to go out. Kivon shenitan reshus lemashchis lahashchis eino mafchin ben tzadik l'rosha. Once the Satan is given permission to destroy, he doesn't differentiate between a tzaddik, someone who's righteous, and someone who's evil. If you go out, you're in danger. It's only the Karban Pesach and the blood on the doors that will rescue you. And when we read this, we don't understand. What does it mean? God controls the Satan. God controls who lives and who dies. Is the Satan like a little child with a hammer in a room of glass chandeliers who goes around breaking things? What does it mean? Kivan shenit and rishos l'mashchis l'ashchis ein lo mavchim et tzadik l'rosha? What does it mean? Rabbi Chana Wasserman in his Kavitz Ma'amorim explains based on the teaching of the Ran. The Ran is a question. The Ran asks that we know on Pesach the world is judged for the tfua, for the wheat of the coming year. And he asks on that Mishnah, which is in Mesech Rosh Hashanah, on Dav He says, what? The world is judged on Pesach for the wheat of the coming year. But on Rosh Hashanah, we were all judged already. The wealth of each individual person was judged. What is left for Pesach for there to be a judgment? And the Ran answers. He says, in heaven, there are two judgments. The din haprati, the din of the yachid, the din of every individual, and Rosh Hashanah, of Rim Lefanov Kibne Maron, God judges each individual. And then there is the din haklali, the din of the tzibur. The din of the tzibur is judged in its time. And on Rosh Hashanah, each individual is judged how we will do financially. But come Pesach, the tzibur, the communities in Klal Yisrael are judged. Rabbi Chana Wasserman asks, but the judgment of the community is just the sum total of all the individuals. Add up what each individual makes, get an accountant, and that's the sum total. It's the same as the Dinah Klali. And Rabbi Hanan answers, no, the Ran is teaching that each individual is judged based on his needs, his merits, what he needs to have in the coming year. There's a dinah klali. 
A community is judged for what it needs in the coming year. There's some judgments that are not the sum total of individuals. Communities need things that individuals may not need. Communities may have merits or faults that every individual may not have. La'olam din haklali goveres al din prati, says the Rebbe Khan. When there's a conflict, when the community needs wealth or poverty, that overrides the individuals. Sometimes we don't know. A tragedy happens. Is it a din haklali? Is it a message to the community? Or a din prati? Or is it that these people are supposed to die? Sometimes it's hard to know. But when seven children, seven children are taken from one family, a beautiful family, in one shot, nobody imagines that it's the din prati. That's the individual judgment. We understand it's a message to a community. We understand that it's a calling for a certain seriousness. In a community, it's a dinah klali. Nobody imagines that it's a dinah prati. Kiven shaniten reshus lamashchis lahashchis. When a community needs a certain din, Makas Bechairais, the night of Mitzrayim in Egypt, was not a din prati. It wasn't that each individual was judged to, be, to die that year. It was a din of Mitzrayim, and they all died. It was a din klali, and a din klali overrides. It's a message to the Egyptians. And Lahavdil, when things happen here, it's a message to the community. And as Rabbi Haber said, we don't know. We don't understand. My Rebbe, Rav Palm, used to say during times of tragedy that we have no Nevi'im, we have no prophets, but the things we know we have to do, the things we struggle with on a constant basis, those are things that we need to fix when we hear a message. And we heard a message, a message of Akedas Hadas, of accepting God's will. Words seared into my memory. Yesterday I had everything, and today I have nothing. And I surrender my will to the will of the Rabbana Shalom. What does that have to do with little me? What does that have to do with me? God, don't test me. Rabbani Shalom, don't put any of us to that test. What does it have to do with me? And the answer is that it has to do with us. I want to tell you that this Friday night, there was a fire in a home in Flatbush on East 19th Street, not on Bedford Avenue. There was a fire in a Jewish home. It was earlier. The children got out. The fire trucks came. You can go down East 19th Street between Avenue R and S and see the home is boarded up. There was a fire. And there were parents who were in a lot of pain. I don't know the parents personally, but they lost their home. They had to run somewhere else for Shabbos. And I don't doubt the human that they didn't understand. And then they heard about another fire, another tragedy. And suddenly they say, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Suddenly they're not complaining. It's difficult. It's hard. 
but they're all intact. How often do we complain about little things? Do you think there's anyone that was at the funeral yesterday and came home and had the pains and aches and suffering? That's part of life. And said, God, why are you doing this to me? It lasts a little while. I know a woman in Flatbush. I'll never forget, she fixed up her home. And I was visiting. And she told me there was no kitchen fixture. The home had been fixed up and she said, you know, there's a word she said. I visited every single fixture store in New York City and can't find the right fixture. I found a beautiful one in the wrong color. She was in pain. I couldn't believe it. She had complaints. Unhappy. Fixed up a whole home. You know what happens when you start complaining? You live a life of complaints. And you start complaining about fixtures. Then you complain about husbands. Then you complain about parents. And suddenly your life is a miserable life because you complain. We complain too much. We're the richest community, the richest Jewish community that B'nai Yisrael have known certainly since Spain. And we're full of complaints and unhappiness. We worry about our finances, we worry about our children, we worry about all the things that normal growing people worry about, and we fret over it and make our lives miserable over it. Instead of counting our blessings, we look at what we don't have and what someone else has. I was in Israel in the summer. And a young man learning the kolel in our Sameach had a shaila for me. And listen to this. He's learning in our Sameach for many years. And he had a child. And he was making a bris. His mother-in-law, who was not an observant woman, he and his wife, Abali Tshuva, had come, was there when the baby was born, helped her daughter with the baby, but left before the bris. She had to go back. And she gave them money to pay for the bris. So this young man asked me the day before the bris, he says, you know, my mother gave me, mother-in-law gave me a certain amount of money. So I spent money on the bris, everything I could think of. And there's still money left over. Am I allowed to keep it? Am I allowed to spend it on other things? It's designated for the bris. So I spoke with him, and we, made it, we spoke that he'll call his mother-in-law and thank her and mention that he's using the leftover money for the baby. Fine. The next morning is the bris. The bris. He honored me to be a sandik for the child. And then afterwards, we go together to the dining room for the bris. I get this. You're not going to believe it. There were no balloons Zero balloons. The tablecloths were white. They weren't colored. They weren't blue for a blue baby. And for a white baby with blue. For a boy. What was on the table? Some bagels and cream cheese and tuna and burakas. There were no hot dishes. And this poor fool was happy. He said, I can't think about what else to spend money on for the bris. And we make ourselves miserable because we have A, B, and C, but we don't have D and E. And if we can't afford the balloons, we're miserable if we don't have them. I always wonder what Elio Hanavi thinks when he walks into the bris and he sees balloons. What do balloons have to do with the bris? 
we make ourselves miserable for no reason. We could be happier. We need to let the lesson continue. The lesson of the tragedy, it's hard, it's difficult. The lesson of the words we heard yesterday, ah, incredible words, incredible words. I want to tell to you a story we have in Yeshiva Taravadas that gets passed down regarding one of our founding, almost founding Menahalim, the legendary Rav Shagafaival Mendelovitz, who was the Benahel of our yeshiva during the Holocaust years. And he would relate the following story. He said he received a wire from Rabbi Weissmandel in Europe during the war. And Rabbi Weissmandel told him, send me a hundred dollars a soul. I can buy the lives of Jews for a hundred dollars a pop. Send me money. Arab Shagafai Mendelovich ran around raising money. And clandestinely through Switzerland, they sent money. Trains were turned back. My father in law should live and be well, and his entire family was on a train that was turned back and survived. And Arab Shagafai came into a store, a regular retail store, and the owner was in the back in his office. And he went to him and he said, a hundred dollars a soul, I can buy Jews. And the man said to Rabbi Mendelovich, you see my cash register? Go take whatever you want. Rabbi Mendelovich said to the man, I feel funny going to your cash register. Please, why don't you come and give it to me? And the man said to him, you see, from here to the cash register, it's 20 feet. In those 20 feet, my feeling will cool off. By the time I get there, you're not going to get everything. You go take it. Regesh cools off very quickly. Very quickly. Another week and two weeks, and this will be in the history of the tragedies that the Jewish people have suffered. The idea that life will never be the same is unfortunately the way it should be, but not the way it is. We need to seize the message. We need to take the idea of refraining from having these bitter complaints about what we don't have and focus on what we do have. It's a message. I knew a Holocaust survivor who I knew quite well in our neighborhood. He passed away a couple of years ago. His name was Anshul Tesler. He told me that he was in Auschwitz. And the day they were liberated, he made up his mind that he's not praying to God anymore. He said, God, I pray to you every day for two years. And the Gehenna continued. That's it. I'm not praying to you anymore. And I said to him, Anshul, so what happened? He said, I woke up the next morning. I said, I'm not praying to you anymore. And they took us to eat breakfast. He said, I know you're not allowed to eat breakfast before you pray. I wasn't going to fast the whole day. So I had to pray. So I prayed in order to eat breakfast. Anshul. Emun Apshuta. Incredible. Akedas Hadas. I don't understand. God, don't test me. Don't test me like you tested Eov. Don't test me like you tested my father. God forbid, don't test me like you tested the Sassoon family. But we're all tested. We're all tested to have complaints to God. 
let's take the lesson in those moments when we are tested. In all the years of his life, my father never went back home. His sister went back home. His brother went back home to see. My father never went. He didn't feel to go back. About 25 years ago, almost the last decade, a little over of 15 years of his life, he went, but he didn't go back home. He traveled. This was right before the Iron Curtain fell. He traveled back, and he traveled back to his father's gravesite. He didn't go to his home. He went to his gra father's gravesite, was there, and then came back. As I said, he could never really talk about it. But I was old enough to understand what was happening. He went back. His father died, was killed, was murdered when my father was 14. My father went back. He was probably 65. 60, 65. And he went back. He said, Daddy, I still don't understand. I still don't understand. But I did what you would have wanted me to do. I raised a family. I lived a life of Torah, Avoda, give me las chesed. I pray every day. God, I don't understand. But I did it. And for him, that was closure. And for us, we're little people, little nisyonot, little tests. We need to do it in, on our own, our own level. We need to do it in our own homes. We need to do it in our own lives. We need to, to take control of ourselves. Our complaints, complaints, Complaints? If do you hear a speech like that? We need to be happier people, more satisfied people. We need to be brave enough to make simchot and not have to keep up with everyone else. We need to be brave enough and smart enough to be happy with what we have. And when we struggle, we need to be able to say to God, I don't understand. My neighbor is no better than me. Why does my neighbor have more money? Why does my neighbor have more success with his children? Why? I don't know. I don't know. I take what the Rabbana Shalom gives me and I use it to serve him. My goal in life is that one day, when I feel I'm getting older, which I hope won't happen for quite a long time, and I'll go back to my father's kever, as I do every year on his yard site, and I'll say, Daddy, I wasn't tested like you were tested. Like you were tested. I'm a little person. I have my little tests. But you accept it, and I accept. There are things that you wished would have been different. There are things in my life I wish would be different. But I take the portion that the Rabboni Shalom gives me, and I use it to serve him. As much as I can understand, I understand. And beyond that, I'm Avraham Avinu at the Akedah. I surrender my intellect with love to the Rabboni Shlolem who I trust, who I trust gives me exactly what I need, what I want. 
let us all resolve to make that speech that we heard yesterday, and if you didn't hear it, that you'll still find a way to hear, let it enter your soul, let it permeate your personality, let it become you, let it become you. Complaints, complaints. We've lived through a moment in our history that could remain forever a memorable moment. The speech, and it wasn't a hespit, it was a speech, a Musr lesson that was said yesterday, could be something repeated by Rebbe to Talmud, by father to child, two or three generations from now. If we choose to make that speech have an eternity, have a life forever, if we choose to make it part of the personality of our people here in our community, we'll give it wings, we'll give it life, we'll give it eternity. All those years that were taken away from these children will be years that will be given to that speech, that lesson, Those magnificent words. We can't give life to the children anymore. We can give life to the lesson. Let's try to make that happen. It should be a chayim, a life, a long arichas yomim. To the lesson that we learned, it'll make us happier, it'll make us better people. Thank you.